for thou hast said, Separated from me, ye can do nothing. We know it. We acknowledge it. And it applies to this very moment and hour. But Lord, we pray, close up the gap. Remove every form and degree of separateness from thyself. May there be such a oneness with thee that thou art able to bear thine own fruit through this ministry. And so shall the Father be glorified for this we ask in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. I pray I must ask you to look at quite a handful of fragments of the scripture going back to the first book of the Kings first book of the Kings chapter 8 at verse 1 And King Solomon, pardon, these then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the princes of the fathers' houses, of the children of Israel, unto King Solomon in Jerusalem. Verse 22 And Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands toward heaven. Verse 62 And the king and all Israel with him offered sacrifice before the Lord. And Solomon offered for the sacrifice of peace offerings which he offered unto the Lord to and twenty thousand oxen and an hundred and twenty thousand sheep. So the king and all the children of Israel dedicated the house of the Lord. Now, the letter to the Ephesians. Chapter 1, verse 8. According to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and Prudent, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, 
which he purposed in him unto a dispensation of the fullness of the time to sum up all things in Christ, things in the heavens and the things upon the earth. Chapter 2 And you, when ye were dead through your trespasses and sins. For in the foretime ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that now walketh in the sons of disobedience, among whom we also all once lived in the lusts of our flesh, doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, quickened us together with Christ. By grace I he saved, and raised us up with him, made us to sit with him in the heavenly, in Christ Jesus. Chapter 3, verse 17. Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, to the end that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be strong to apprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that ye may be filled unto all the fullness of God. Finally, chapter 5, verse 27. He might present the church to himself a glorious God, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without Now, so far as I am concerned, come to the last of these particular messages, and I have to confess to you, far from the end of what I wanted to say, and into this brief hour, not the sky, but the dinner is the limit. I am very much cast upon the Lord, dead in an immense amount. But He will decide. He shall register in the Spirit when it's again. You have been occupied witnesses of the unsearchable riches. And we have been allowing Solomon to be for us an illustration and interpreter of him who is a greater than He, Solomon, being but a foreshadow of Christ, foreshadowing is always so much less than the foreshadow. But he helps us toward that greater. We have contemplated aspects of that great. 
amidst the many aspects of Solomon's greatness, greatness of his wisdom, greatness of his riches, greatness of his glory, the greatness of his food, that was one thing I wanted to have a whole hour on. The greatness of his honor amidst this many-sided greatness of Solomon. There stand out most prominently over all the altar and the house. The altar and the house. What we have read just now, and you would be well to read the corresponding record in the book of the Chronicles, what we have just read about Solomon gathering all the people, princes, and heads of father, father's houses, whole congregations, to Jerusalem for the dedication of the house of God. You notice it is very closely related to the cross. You were impressed, perhaps you were not, you ought to have been number of the same. Just unimaginable. But notice before you go further with that that these two supreme Three dominant greatnesses are the altar and the house are focused in the person as king. Keep that in mind. It is the person himself now as king sitting upon the throne of David, I lift it up. It is he as such who gives the significance to the altar and the house. They take their meaning and their character from him in his exalted position in his glory. That's a statement I trust you will hold on to as we go on. Now consider the greatness of this altar. I haven't read the description of the building of the altar. If you do so, you will see that it was an immense altar. An immense altar. Tremendous thing. The the very thickness of it is said to be a hand breadth in thickness. Well, that's something. Mine isn't such a big hand, but even if that pan of brass was the thickness of the walls of the altar, the whole thing, when you get the full dimensions, means that it must have been a tremendous thing, a very weighty. Not some light thing at all. And then a much fuller description of it is given, which makes you feel well, this must have been an immense altar. And as for the sacrifice, two and twenty thousand dollars. You picture that? Coming, coming, 
in a procession reaching almost to the horizon. Here they come, battalion upon battalion of us, all wending their way toward that point. Two and twenty thousand of them. And that's only the beginning. Following them, a thousand are sheep. almost unthinkable, unimaginable. You look and you see this dark line of oxen and sheep reaching right away, as I have said, almost to the horizon. Here they come. How many days it will take to sacrifice all day. And what rivers of blood will be poured out as they are sacrificed day after day from morn to evening. I've often felt that I would not like to have been of the priests and Levites who had that job. Certainly needed a good many courses of Levites to slay that My point is the immensity of this sacrifice and the meaning of this altar, an altar that could contain all that, could put all that into effect. How great that altar. And a greater than Solomon is here. A greater altar. A transcendently greater sacrifice is here in the greater son of David, the Lord Jesus. You see, this was, after all, but an historical thing, a thing in time. It's written in the book, belongs to a long past day, a long ago. It's a record and a story of something that happened then. And it's a way back there, and it stays a way back. In itself, it was the days of Solomon. Their past and gone, and all that past. A historical in the life of an Athlin nation. When you pass. Solomon and his altar and sacrifice to the greater, the greater than Solomon, it's there that you find the first point of the superiority, the transcendence of the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is super historical. That is, it outbounds all time. It ranges from eternity to eternity. The Lamb was slain before the foundation of the world, and when all the ages passed in procession before our eyes, through the Bible, Old and New Testaments, and we come beyond time when time is no more, and in eternity the Lamb, in the midst of the throne is the object dominating everything. Super historical, outranging all time. 
by reason of a virtue, a virtue that was never in two and twenty thousand oxen, thousands of sheep, offered by Solomon, a virtue. You know the letter to the Hebrews. Are possible that the blood of bulls and of goats take away sin? Read that letter again in the light of this. He, not by two and twenty thousand oxen and thousands of sheep, but by one went further than all they did more than all they did, effected what they never could effect. It was a virtue in his sacrifice. It's an impressive thing that in the earlier Christian literature, I mean the earlier narratives of the New Testament, the crucifixion is hardly mentioned. It is hardly mentioned. The crucifixion. But the death is everywhere. He died. He died. It's the death that is the prominent thing, not the crucifixion. The crucifixion is the historic aspect. It's just the thing that man did. But within that man did, within that outward aspect of his death, there was a virtue, a mighty virtue, which was dealing with a force, an immense, unspeakably strong, deep force of evil that has accounted for all these centuries of this world's misery. And will account for eternity's misery for men. But behind, behind, and deeper down than the crucifixion was the death. A mighty, virtuous death. A virtuous death. Something that if you touch it or it touches you means a registration of something awful, something terrible. You know, if you and I are at all spiritually sensitive, we touch certain realms and certain things we have a kickback. What Brother Watchman, he used to call the earth touch. Touch that. You become involved in that. Voluntarily. Voluntarily involved in that. In this world. And if you're spiritually alive and sensitive, something there that stings you. You feel you've been tainted. Feel that you've been pulled out of position. Feel you've got to get away and have a spiritual bath. Wash yourself. Get before the Lord. Take the mighty efficacy of the blood. Get you back again into your proper realm as a child of God. Aren't you... This is a real, real evidence that we are born again. And it becomes increasingly like that as we go on. Mark of growth is this 
deepening sensitiveness to what is life and what is death. And it is the governing and deciding thing in guidance. Yes. The law of the spirit of life is the law of guidance. The mind of the spirit is life and peace. That's a guiding law. But I must not be too detailed. Back of his sacrifice, there was a virtue, a power, was never in all the sacrifices of him. It's not the crucifixion. Can wear the crucifix. Make a lot of the crucifix, the earthly physical suffering. But the New Testament puts its finger not upon that, but upon the mighty, mighty power of his death. It's a power that vetoes, a power that prohibits, a power on the one side that says to a whole system and order and realm and universe. No. No. Again. Be united with him in the likeness of his death is to become aware of what is and what is not acceptable to God because that is the effect of the cross of the Lord Jesus. Christian life is, is that. Is that. Yes. It is super historical. It reaches back to eternity. It passes through all time and reaches on to eternity to be this mighty effectiveness and virtue of the death of the Lord Jesus. The crucifixion was less than 40 years old when the epistles were written. If something like this had happened within the last 40 years of our life, we'd be talking about the thing, shouldn't we? Oh, that awful thing. That, that killing. What happened there on that cross, on that hill? We'd be occupied with all that. These apostles were not occupied with that. They're occupied with the the inner meaning of it. What it means in the spiritual realm. Ours and all others. This is something tremendous. It's the spiritual and inner meaning and power of the cross. It is the New Testament. have this immense thing. Of course, it's only a figure and type and is given to us in Solomon to show us figuratively, symbolically, in type, how great, immense and massive is the death of Jesus, sacrifice of our Lord. Now, oh, you see, I can strive to find words to set this forth, but I know I'm defeated when I start because I know that it is going to take all the ages of the ages to tell the story. They will be singing the song of the Lamb forever. We know so little, but all we can say here at a time like this is that to seek that the Lord shall make an impression upon us. This cross about which we talk so much and think we, we 
know because we've got the terms, the language, the phrasing. Identification with Christ, union with him in his death and burial and resurrection and all the rest of it. We think we know. Haven't we begun to know? The immensity of what Jesus was and did in his cross. Solomon is after all but a shadow and yet and yet think. Two and twenty thousand oxen and thousands of trailing for days towards the altar being sacrificed all the land around saturated with them. Priests by relay after relay being exhausted to accomplish this thing. And they found mere shadow of the reality. The cross of our Lord Jesus it's extra historical. It is extraterrestrial. You stumble at the language. Language will defeat us. Extraterrestrial, I have said. That is, it is above this earth. Above this world, it reaches far beyond what is here. It is, may I use another phrase, it is super cosmic. This cross, this cross, this death of the Lord Jesus not only takes in all that is here on this earth, but it reaches unto heaven. The heavens were defiled. The heavens were defiled. Something happened in heaven before it happened on the earth. It began there when the angels who kept not their first estate were cast out, held in everlasting chains. The devil who led them lost his place but in it all the heavens were divine. a great schism took place in heaven the beginning of all schisms unto this day that's where it began and that's where it came from it is a much bigger thing than this world all in this letter who called Ephesians? Does gives us a glimpse, doesn't he? Our wrestling is not with flesh and blood, but with principality, our world rulers of this darkness, who some wicked spirit. That's the realm where the cross has its range and its reach but four calls in the heavens in the heavens one of the most difficult phrases in the New Testament the whole Bible to define and explain we haven't time even to attack it but our point is it's the virtue of the death of the Lord Jesus reaches through all ranges and all realms until it reaches the very throne of heaven itself. And there, the Lamb, is the testament to the universality of what was done at that spot, at that moment in time here. How vast a range is the death of the Lord Jesus. Solomon's sacrifice, great as it was, didn't reach beyond the locality. 
death of the Lord Jesus harms all locusts. Is super terrestrial. Coming nearer, we've read Ephesians, we have redemption in his blood. Oh, lovely thing, redemption. We rejoice in redemption. Think about it. One of our favorite words and topics. I am redeemed. But you notice that it's a compound word with a prefix. Re- Look again at all the words with that prefix. Reconciliation. Restoration. Redemption. Something was and it was lost. Something was and it was forfeited. Something was sold into the slave market. Those of you who know your New Testament know so much about this. But this, this cross, this death, is a redemption, a recovery of all not only man's condition and man's loss, but more than that, a recovery of all that God lost in man. Of God's purpose. Of God's intention. Of God's destiny. It was for the time being lost to him. And there's a very much larger context, of course, to our gospel. Son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. This sheep, if you like, sons, if you like, all that and more. But the loss, the loss that took place is almost indescribable when you trace it to God. You know, right there, right there where the Lord Jesus is speaking about the loss and the Son of Man coming I mean, for the purpose of seeking and saving that which was lost. He, he includes what we call the parable of the prodigal. Wrong, a misnomer altogether. Of course, you go on using it like that. But when he comes to this, this, this man, this son, it's called the prodigal. He is far away, lost to the Father. Lost to the home. Lost to the family. Translate that into heavenliness, heavenly things. The Lord knows what he's talking about when he makes that man discovering and coming alive to his lost condition and the causes of it when he makes him say, puts into his man or mouth these words in his return, Father, Father, what does he say? I've been a bad boy. I made a mistake. I did the wrong thing. I brought a lot of trouble upon myself. All this is because of my, my fault. You made him say that? Father, I have sinned against heaven. And in thy sight. Lord Jesus is meticulously careful in how he puts them. This, this loss is against heaven. 
is heaven that has lost. And sin is robbing heaven of its rights and the father of his rights has sin. I have sinned against heaven. I say. That is why there is joy in the presence of the angels over one sin. That repented because heaven has got back that which was stolen from it. Heaven has recovered. Recovered. What heaven lost. And more than that, the angels are more concerned for the Father than even for heaven. Father has got back that which is his right stolen from him by the great feet. A great feet. Well, you see, we have redemption. Oh, how great a thing is redemption. Isn't it? Not only man, it is the universe. The universe is full of conflict, full of strife, full of controversy. In the very atmosphere of this universe, they are contending. It's a terrible thing when in our spiritual sensitiveness we get into that atmosphere that realm where the two things are clashing that which is of the law that which is of heaven that which we know to be our real realm and life we come into the atmosphere where there's antagonism and hatred and malice it's a terrible thing to feel the, the very Hostility that is in the atmosphere in this world. Many who have labored in heathen countries know what I'm talking about if you don't. Go there. I have been. Some of them. I remember my first visit to India. My, I went out where there was idol worship, where the idol was stuck up in a, in a place with a fence round. People were furtive, afraid, they passed by, in terror. And it was not just something objective. You felt, as you feel in those temples, those, those heathen temples, something evil. Something evil. I want to get away. I'm going to say a thing now that put me into a lot of trouble in certain realms. I felt that on my first visit to St. Peter's Rome. Of course, first visiting Rome, you want to see all the... I went to the college. I went to this place and that. And then I wanted to see the Sistine Chapel. And I wanted... And I went in. Dear friends, this is no, no fiction, imagination. I went in innocently to see a sight. I was a Christian. And when I got in there, in the tents of death, death so overwhelmed me that I felt physically ill. I couldn't stay long. I looked round, I watched what was going on, and I had to get out. Not until I got right away did I feel better. Something there in the realm of a, a spiritual antagonist. Now, many of you are doing this? that in this very universe there is this this conflict because of what began at the beginning 
coming from heaven through all realms and polluting all realms and at last registering its pollution upon this. There. But Calvary has no The death of the Lord Jesus has delivered from that. Glorious and wonderful thing to be delivered from that. I'm not talking of geography. It's where you need an hour of explanation of the meaning of the heavenly. See the heavenlies or you get a mentality up there somewhere. I want to say to you that all that is in the heavenlies, good and bad, registers in your spirit. You are as near to the heavenlies in your spirit as Never be geographical. Oh, Trushke. He know what he was talking about when he said to his men, who he sent up into all his first of all, you look round and see if you can find this place that the Christians call heaven. And when they came back and reported, he said, I, I asked them to look for this thing. They said, of course, they never found any such place. Poor man. Oh man, if he'd become a Christian, he would know. He would know there is a, something more than a geographical realm. When you speak of the heaven, you're speaking about super cosmic, cosmic forces of evil and antagonism. But blessed be God, we have three On that, good to be outside of that world, isn't it? Had a week outside of it, or in some of the meaning of being outside. Well, you have to go back, but you need not be going. They are not of the world, even as I am not. Redeemed. And then, thank God, this creation itself is redeemed. Redeemed. And it's waiting now for the day when that redemption will be consummated. And the creation, as Paul puts it, shall itself be delivered from the bondage of When this earth as it is and this world will have been burnt up with all that is in it and a new heaven and a new earth redeemed. Redeemed. That was effected and secured in the death of Jesus Christ. In the death of Jesus Christ. Now you want an hour on 1 Corinthians 15, don't you? Wonderful revelation of redeemed, resurrected physical bodies. The great question. I thought that I might have had some time to talk about this. The great question. How are the dead raised up? And with what? Body, do they come? Cremated bodies. A handful of dust taken out and scattered on the waves of the sea. A body burned to cinders in some farm. How are the dead raised? And with what body do they come? Well, here's the exceeding greatness of his wisdom. Thou fool! Thou fool! You are governed in your Ideas by your own natural wisdom. You fool. The wisdom of man is utter foolish. How are the dead raised up? And Paul answers. 
You have got a spirit. You have got a spirit. As believers, that spirit has been born in you. In that spirit is the divine life, indestructible life, incorruptible life. That is the germ and God in your physical disintegration sows that spirit and then gives it up on as it pleases him. Gives it up on. You get a germ and quicken it and the body corresponding will follow. This is a mystery, of course. How? Oh, Paul says, in this we groan, in this we groan, waiting for our adoption, to wit the redemption of our body, the bringing back of the body to what it was, before this corruption, this seed of corruption was sown. Not fully perfected, but I believe it was a glorious body then. Now this is a part point of this view. But I think when Adam and Eve became aware that they were naked, that symbolic language, some kind of covering has been removed from it. I believe that covering was a covering of some glory. And they became aware that they had lost something glorious as their covering. and They were naked. You know, the New Testament takes up their word naked and relates it not to, not to physical but to a spiritual state. Oh, I'm getting you too deep. But to redeem the body means to bring it back to something which it lost. Which it lost. Have we anything to go upon to establish that? I think we have. I think we have. I have seen people pass from this life. I'm very near to myself. In the compass of my own life. One, a child of God, who had lived, sacrificed and suffered for the Lord, only for the Lord through many years. The other, a rejecter of the Lord person. Consistent through the years. I've seen them both under my own eyes pass out. And as this one passed, all the radiance, the physical radiance, the glory on that face, the renewal of childhood on. I'm not exaggerating. I'm giving an instance. It's like that, you know. I wish it were more true. Indeed, sometimes, you know, the real enjoyment of the Lord, it, it makes a difference to our faith. 
even in poor bodies, suffered much, undergone a great deal. Something, something that speaks to the glory of the Lord in the face and in the eyes. And you don't have to be introduced to the true child of God. You can be introduced to the true child of God. Let the face of the Lord be that the very face you say, you're a Christian, aren't you? Nothing God is not uh, this is simple you know what I mean? Yes, we have evidence now that there is a glory which belongs to this body that sin has marred taken away in dust glory out of the face of the sun. But the redemption of the sun shall be made, says Paul, like unto his glorious body. For the body of his glory cross has secured that body. Oh, how great is this God. Again, work of the Lord Jesus, his sacrifice, being so much greater than Solomon, is inclusive and right. Not all of the blood of bulls, young bulls, old bulls, but comprehending them from the day of Abel through all the sacrifices between Abel up to Abraham, Abraham up to Israel and Moses, all the law. And then, go in this bit, two and twenty thousand, not twenty thousand, go it all in, go it all in, I saw the one lamb comprehend the law. All that never did and never could do. This one offering embraces all. And it's final. It was one offering forever. Having made one offering forever, he said, So far as his work is unsound, as far as his work is concerned as the offering, it is finished. It is No. Let um, me say this before, perhaps. When they brought the pastoral lamb to the priest after it had been laid up for fourteen days for scrutiny and examination, brought to the priest who was an arch critic, a master critic, handed over six feet two and two with those stained eyes, would find him unblemished. One blemish, one spot, one wrinkle, it was rejected. If after its period of probation, priest could absolutely find not one hair on that lamb that was another color, he lifted his hand on the head of the lamb and pronounce formula. Tetelestare, it is perfect. Well, they're the words the Lord Jesus used on the cross. And he offered himself to the arms of It 
it is the apostle himself, right? He offered himself without sin. Final. Blessed be God for this unspeakably marvelous unto himself by glory of him without spot or wrinkle or any such will better less sorry these are unsearchable finality of cross the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus I've only touched the cross you see I told you going to be beaten. I haven't started on the house. Solomon, my son, is yet young and tender, said David, and the house which he built is exceeding. It is for the Lord. Master, it is very great and very wonderful. Will you suffer me a few minutes in this? For here we pass from the type Oh, magnificent. I wonder what your conception of that, that temple of Solomon is. It was very great in itself. I'll ask you to go and see what happened to that. And probably no bigger dimension. But the concentration. And well, in this thing, you come to the house, he is there. He calls my house, your house. My house. Whose house are we? This house which he is building is the embodiment of the concentrated value of Because you see, all this immense sacrifice was in the dedication of the house. It was a dedication. The house takes its dimension, spiritual dimensions from the altar. If that altar is immense like this and that sacrifice incalculable, how great this house must be if all that is required for its dedication. If it takes up all that into it, takes its character from all that in the altar, what a house it must be. But if this house Cost all that. Cost all that. And you must use your imagination that procession of bulls and sheep coming in. Read the story in the context. People willingly offered, but it cost. It cost. It represents great cost. Here it is. Utility. All concentrated in the house. Christ loved it. And gave him. There's a world. Up he goes and tells all that he has. You get the picture of Philippians 2, the last verse. He healed this brother and this sister. And away back to heaven, heaven's throne, his rights in heaven of equality with God and he sells it all. 
divest himself of it. Hunt it not a prize to be of heaven, heaven's glories, heaven's rights, heaven's prerogatives. Everything that he has is the eternal son of the ages. Sell. gave himself that he might present himself. You and I, dear friends, need to recover something beyond the truth of this, the doctrine of this. Recover it infinitely. And if we did that not, not just objectively as some wonderful book, wonderful idea, a wonderful teaching, realize that man is part of that so loved. What a difference it would make on our behalf. And it's meant to do that. And if it doesn't do that, we, with all that we know about the church, we don't know anything. People talk to me. Church doctrine. Church, church ground. However you may put it, I look to you. How they are embracing all Died and not excluding anything, not becoming excluded. All who are embraced by that sacrifice of regard in himself. You cannot be narrow, small, legalistic, exclusive if you have seen because in in the church you have seen Christ cannot separate you from him. See him. And see the value of it because of its cost. Brothers, speaking of you, Jerusalem, heard to all the composition of all manner of things, and the pearls, and the gold. You know it is a challenge to our heart. This is the unsensitive essence of the preciousness of the Lord Jesus. Sing our hymns. Sing our hymns. And we sing, and you know you sing a lot of things that all stop you. And you sing a hymn about marching to Zion and uh, walking the golden street. Walk the golden street. All stop There's only one street in that city. One golden street in that city. You've all got to live on the same street beside each other and live together. Oh, now, are you going to give up Christianity? See what I mean? This preciousness of the Lord Jesus going to make it possible for us at least to live together happily. It will be Christ and not ourselves. The challenge of our human nature. We'll be bound to by him. That's the pure Pure. This is the church and we can 
never, never found it, never get beyond it, we can get in the church. I gain super mundane. Or oh, how I do wish I could get this over to Christians. Biggest problems I think that many Christians have are connected with the church. What is this? What is this church? They bring it down to the local church. Church local. Local assembly. Easy. Now, what we see. What we see. And Christians who are supposed to be members of the body of What we see in local companies of believers, how is this the church? Is this the body of Christ? Is this Ephesians? Oh, how impossible it is along that line of mentality. See that the church exists at all according to the New Testament. Isn't, that, isn't this our trouble? It's my, my problem how to get this over. You see, dear friends, you and I in ourselves are not the church. We are not the church. And we are not parts of the church. We are excommunicated from the church. Not in it. Therefore, therefore, the church, universal or local, is not the aggregate of Christian bodies. The real, real church is the measure of Christ in everyone. Be that when we come to the table this afternoon. Christ is the church and it's just the measure of Christ that is in us that makes up the church. You can't join the church. Transform again your phraseology. There's no such thing as joining the church. If you are not an organic part of Christ produced by his divine life as different from your own you're not in the church but if through new birth you have become inwardly an organic part of Christ the church is there it's when we meet not in bodies but in spirit we can meet in bodies as congregations no church call ourselves no church. It is when we meet in spirit, in the spirit, that Christ is present. Spontaneously, may I say, naturally present. It just is. Don't make it. Don't form it. It may shock you when I say that the apostles never had the idea that they've got to go out and form church. Now, let that get in. They never conceived that they were called upon by the Lord to go and form church. What they did was to go and preach Christ. And not only preach Christ, but bring Christ in their own person. And when people responded to and received Christ into their life, they spontaneously came together. Paul and the other apostles never said, now let's go out and find these people and get them saved and then collect them together and form them into a church. Never. Church was, as our brother said, born. It was a spontaneous birth. And it was the bringing together of in a corporate way. 
and it's inward. You can violate the church immediately you get out of the spirit. Sin against the church immediately you get onto natural ground. Only when we abide in Him, abide in Him, what a lot there is in this. Abide in me. We abide inwardly in the Lord that the church is formed and grows. It is the increase of Christ himself in us that makes it. That doesn't mean, of course, that outwardly we can behave anyhow, careless. Let us get our true ideas. Peter is very clear about this, his spiritual house, his spiritual house. And it's impressive. Note how Peter begins his letter. He's going to speak to you about this spiritual house, God's spiritual house and the living stones, and he begins by saying, Unto the saints, at abroad, abroad throughout Asia, Bithynia, Cappadocia, and What are you talking about? Saints scattered all over the world, and you're going to say one house, one spiritual house. You mean that geography is not the first thing? Being together in one place, there's no seat. No. It's wherever Christ is. Wherever Christ is. There are two or three in any place with Christ in them. That is the church represented. He is the church. It's his own body, not ours. Or how impossible it is to get it over, but you may get an inkling. An inkling. Our shows. Or a finished. I'll close by reminding you that this thing, more than Solomon's house, magnificent and wonderful as it was, this thing is eternal, timeless, not only super mundane above the earth, all that belongs to him, but eternal, chosen in him before the unto him in the church, unto all ages. This is a time. When we are called by Jesus Christ, that's not the beginning of things. That's not the beginning of things. It's only stepping into what began long, long ago before we had a birth. This is an eternal thing. And you say, why? Say that, we know that. All right. Thank God, I do thank God when I look at the history of it. I see the forces against it. And the forces against it, even in the early days of the apostles before the last of them had left the earth, they were had martyred a Roman colony. All the great persecution, all of the Saturn, the Christians in the many parts of the world in the nations in China in Germany anywhere you like all that has happened my the gates of Hades the council of Hades have really really been set against this thing they have stood at nothing to fight this thing out the soul of Tarsus was a a flea bite in the whole thing. Fight this out. Nation, empire, council, ideology, get rid of this. And it goes. And it goes. And it goes on. Carters, yes, lay down their lives. Goes on. His church, but the church of Jesus never will prevail. The gates of Hades shall not prevail again. Shall not prevail. It is timeless. We may go, but on he goes with his church. 
will all be caught up in the end. Great day when he presents us. Oh, faultless indeed. Faultless before the presence of his glory without spot in exceeding joy. I'm quoting scripture. And us caught up into that though we may have died in the martyrdoms, the persecutions, or whatever has come in time. I'll leave it there. Big enough for you. Contemplation. After all, dear friends, let me say again, all that I had ever hoped would be the result of this ministry this week. I have been so much exercised about it, and not least how on earth I would have been. My expectation has only been that an impression would be made. And such an indelible Deep and strong. Not only a remembering of something wonderful to have That is all true. God has told me to I'm in no serious trouble. I'm in the thing out down the all ages and all realms. Outbounding all enemies and adverse forces. I'm called into something immense. Oh, how great our Christ is. How great his church is. How great his house is. God make this govern our conduct, our behavior, our manner of life, our influence on other people as we meet them even. Oh, may this be there. That these people are people of dignity. People represent something. These are not the mean, contemptible dignity about that otherwise insignificant little man and boy. Speaks of another realm. Lord, give us significance, significance of Himself, great power. It came from Thee. We believe. We hand it back to Thee. Do what You can with it, Lord. Work upon it. Keep it alive. Watch over it to protect it. And we say, through it all, through it all, unto him be the glory, in the church, by Christ Jesus, unto all ages, forever and ever.